Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here today. I trust that everyone had a safe and wonderful Memorial Day weekend. A little different than most that we've experienced and what we've become accustomed to. Um, but I do have to start today's press conference on a somber note because I think, as all of you are aware, this weekend, Louisiana State Police Trooper George Baker uh, passed away, uh, succumbed to injuries that he sustained in the line of duty. Um, in addition to being a state police officer, uh, he also served, I think, at the police department in Greensburg for the St. Lena Parish Sheriff's Office. He was also a United States Marine. So he, he served his country, he served his state, he served his parish and, and his community, and he did so well. In a final act of service to others, uh, Trooper Barker donated his organs so that others uh, may receive the gift of life. So I would ask everyone to join me uh, and Donna in praying for his wife, Heather, their daughter, Harper, uh, and Trooper uh, Barker's entire family, Baker's entire family, I should say. Um, I have ordered the flags to fly at half staff uh, in his honor tomorrow, which is also the day of his memorial service uh, in Hammond. For today's reporting, uh, we are reporting 443 new COVID-19 cases around the state. Uh, that brings the total tested positive thus far today to, uh, thus far I should say, to 38,497. So those 443 cases are on 600, I'm sorry, 6,621 new tests, bringing us to a total of 347,647 tests. Um, I would like to point out that over the weekend, uh, the ranking of the states changed on per capita cases. We are now number nine, so we moved down another slot. Um, you may recall that a couple of months ago, we were number two in the country in per capita cases. I also point out, because we didn't uh, have our press conference on Memorial Day, the recovered uh, is now estimated at uh, 28,700. So that leaves us about 10,000 active COVID-19 cases based, based on tests. Uh, that number has been remarkably steady uh, for at least the last, last month or so. Uh, and we should always remember there are a number of individuals out there who have COVID-19 who've not been tested. So there are well over 10,000 cases. We don't know that precise number, but the CDC estimates that somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of people with COVID are totally asymptomatic or so mildly symptomatic that they're likely not to be tested and show up in those test numbers. So as we increase our test numbers and our cases, one of the things that we look at is the percentage of positivity among the tests that we administer. Uh, and the World Health Organization and the CDC uh, have a goal of 10%. If you're below 10%, uh, you're doing relatively well. If you're above 10%, you've got a ways to go. I think if you look at the total number of tests administered and the total number of cases, it's about 11%. But you've got to remember that weeks ago, uh, we were testing people who were in hospitals almost exclusively, and so our test positivity rate at one point was in the 40s. I think so it's it's coming down and then if you look more recently at, at a daily uh, number on on positivity they've all been below 10 percent um, today it was 6.7 percent yesterday it was 2.4 percent on more than 10,000 tests and so so we're we're doing relatively well uh, on that metric as well um, and and of course uh, the comprehensive testing that we're doing uh, in the month of May, um, I think has a lot to do uh, with that that uh, positivity uh, rating. I would I would point out that uh, we are on track. We told you that our testing goal for May was 200,000. Uh, as of today, uh, in this month, we have uh, tested 179,369. So that leaves about 20,631. 
uh, test that we need to administer uh, over the last several days of May in order to get to that 200,000 level. That's a little over 5,100 tests per day. We believe that we will make it. We know that we're resourced and, and we're out uh, with all of our partners and doing the mobile testing across the state. So we think we're going to get to that 200,000 tests, which is 4.3% uh, of the state's population. Uh, so, so that's that's a critical uh, uh, number, and that's more than twice the minimum amount that's recommended by the federal government. They recommend uh, no less than two percent, and we believe we'll, we'll be at 4.3 percent in in the month of May. We're ramping up testing all across the state in those areas that have been inadequately tested up to now, where we might see hot spots, but also in congregate settings. Uh, both with respect to residents and staff. Uh, and in those settings, and in those settings only, uh, the CDC recommends for sentinel surveillance, I think is what they're calling it, that you actually test symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. Unfortunately, today we are reporting new deaths, 21 of them, which brings the total number of deaths to 2,617. We do have some more good news on the number of COVID Patients that are hospitalized across the state of Louisiana, that number today is 798. This is the first time in two full months that we've dipped below 800. Uh, so even as the cases increase, we see the hospitalizations uh, decreasing. Uh, 100 of those uh, 798 patients are on mechanical ventilators. I want to talk a little bit today about something that you've heard about uh, not, not so much in Louisiana, but around the country, and I think uh, most of the early stories came out of New York City. But according to the Centers for Disease Control, uh, MISC, which is which is the acronym for multi I'm sorry, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Uh, is something that that um, that is real and it's happening around the country and it's happening here in Louisiana um, obviously um, like its name uh, would indicate this condition uh, in children where different body parts can become inflamed including the heart the lungs the kidneys brain skin eyes gastrointestinal organs and we don't yet know exactly what causes it but we know there is a relationship to the virus uh, with these children, that they've had it, or that they've been uh, in contact with someone who actually had COVID-19 disease. Uh, and it can be serious, uh, and it can be deadly. But most children who are diagnosed with this condition uh, do get better uh, with appropriate medical care. Um, and, and the definition of an MISC case, the individual has to be under the age of 21 with a fever, uh, evidence of inflammation and severe illness involving more than two organs uh, that requires hospitalization and no other plausible diagnosis and then a positive COVID-19 test or exposure to a confirmed case within the four weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. So when you when we talk about this particular syndrome that's that's what we're talking about. I do want you to know it's in Louisiana, uh, and that's why the Department of Health has shared two of what they call health alerts to all health care providers across the state, first on May the 9th and then again on May the 15th. Uh, these alerts raise awareness of MISC and urge providers who have cared uh, for or are caring for uh, currently patients younger than 21 years of age and meeting these criteria to immediately port them to the Office of Public Health uh, Infectious Disease Epidemiology Team. We can tell you that we have 13 confirmed cases of MISC across the state of Louisiana and one um, MISC-related death. Uh, to respect the privacy of the young person and that person's family, obviously we're not going to share any additional uh, details at this time. Of the 13 confirmed cases, the range in age is from 0 to 19. The median age is 11. Six of the patients are female, seven are male. Four are hospitalized. Twelve, I'm sorry, eight have been discharged. Uh, in terms of race, seven are 
black, three are white, and three fit in the other category. In terms of ethnicity, two are Hispanic and 11 are non-Hispanic. For context, we know that we have had 880 cases tested of COVID-19 in individuals who were 18 years old and younger. The Department of Health will report this data weekly uh, on Mondays in its coronavirus webpage. And if we have more updates that need to be brought to your attention, uh, I will relay them here as well at our press conferences. The website that you can get this information is ldh.la.gov. Uh, finally, um, you may have seen that the Department of Revenue under Secretary Kimberly Robinson is waiving penalties for March and April sales tax returns. Um, so they will waive penalties for sales tax filers who submit their March 2020 and April 2020 returns and remit the sales tax and any interest owed by June the 30th. If a taxpayer cannot remit the sales tax and interest by June 30th, they may still be eligible uh, to have the penalty relief if they can enter into an installment payment agreement uh, by June the 30th. So at this time, I've got a couple of questions from the public that we will entertain, and then we will take questions from those of you here. Andrea in Lake Charles, is there any need for people with no symptoms to get tested? And if we're negative, do we need to get retested at any point? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're still following the CDC guidance, uh, which is not for the general public to be tested if they are asymptomatic. There is asymptomatic testing as part of our surveillance program in congregate settings. Uh, so in places like these uh, uh, labor camps or uh, jails, prisons, nursing homes, uh, and that goes for patients and staff. Um, but for other individuals uh, who are asymptomatic, uh, we are not presently uh, encouraging them to, to get tested. Um, I will tell you that anyone who receives a negative test, that means that they are negative on that day. It does not mean that they won't become positive at some point in the future. Uh, and theoretically, it can happen the very next day. Um, and so that one test uh, is, is important, but it's, uh, it doesn't mean that you won't get it in the future. And so if you test uh, negative, but then subsequently uh, develop symptomatic, I'm, so, I'm sorry, symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, uh, you need to be tested again. Rosa in Shreveport wants to know if it's safe to eat uh, in restaurants. Um, well, the way that we've um, arranged for restaurants to operate, both uh, inside at 25% with social distancing and outside, uh, with social distancing, uh, it is safe. Uh, obviously, you're safer at home, and the message for any individual who is vulnerable to this disease by virtue of their age or underlying comorbid health condition, uh, again, those are hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, obesity, those things, um, then they are obviously much safer at home. However, if you go to a restaurant um, and, and you eat and individuals who are serving you and, and the employees have their masks on and you wear your mask to and from your table and you're sitting with individuals who are from uh, your immediate household, uh, you can do that safely. Um, and so uh, we just want to make sure that you feel safe when you go there. Uh, and again, wearing that mask protects others from yourself. And when they wear a mask, they protect you from themselves. And what we've learned from the Centers for Disease Control is they now believe that the vast majority of cases are contracted not because of people are touching surfaces, surfaces where the virus is, but through uh, airborne uh, particles uh, that contain uh, the virus. And so it's being spread when people are talking, like I'm talking right now, or if, if you call for sneeze and that sort of thing. And that's why that face covering uh, is so important. So I want to thank uh, Andrea and, and Rosa for their questions. And I'll thank you in advance uh, for your qu Well, Before we do that, did you want to say anything about those two questions? I'm, I'm happy to ask. Okay. So with that, we'll, we'll uh, take your questions now as well. Craig? You're either in the middle or, or 
near the end of the 14-day period where, you, where you're mm -hmm. analyzing the data and the trajectory of... The Are you about to do what you always do? Of course. <laughs> okay. Are, is the, I'm going to do what I always do. Is the state currently meeting, meeting those... I know it could change, but right yeah. now, as you analyze Well, you know, there's, there's so many different things that you look at, and so I can't, I'm not going to tell you that we're meeting the criteria. I'm going to tell you uh, that we are uh, tracking reasonably well when you look at the overall numbers for the state. I just mentioned to you that the uh, percentage of positive cases is well in hand, uh, that uh, the number of hospitalizations uh, is at the lowest it's been in two months. And, so forth. Um, but sometimes if you have populous regions of the state, such as New Orleans and Jefferson Parish, uh, and they had such a high case level at one time that if they decrease substantially, you, in all you're looking at is the state numbers, you don't really know what's happening by region and by parish and so forth, uh, in, including hospitalizations. So we're going to look at all of that. Um, I, I, am, um, I am encouraged, but I am not making any announcement today. Uh, we, that announcement will be made uh, next week as to what the decision is. The current phase two um, order is in effect through June the 5th, which is a week from Friday. Uh, and so as I, as I mentioned to you early next week, I hope to do it on the 1st, but you know, 1st is also the last day of the, the regular session, but we also know it's also the first day of the special session. So I think we can probably keep that timeline um, because I don't think it's going to be a real climactic day in terms of a lot of important legislation uh, pending and trying to get through conference committee reports and that sort of thing. So hopefully we're going to be able to keep that, that um, day for making the announcement, which means we're going to be doing the analysis, uh, where they're doing the analysis now. I will be receiving that analysis and the recommendation of the Department of Health over the weekend. And you will know when I make the announcement, Craig, but I appreciate you, your persistence on that. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor, Friday will mark two weeks phase one. We really haven't seen any spike in cases yet. The only high numbers are those days when new labs have come online. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, a lot of stuff points to seeing those spikes after two weeks. So is this about the time towards the end of this week where we can start seeing those spikes or has it really been a best case scenario how it has looked in phase one? As far? Well, you know, that's, that's a, a great question because we know is if you bring more people into contact with one another, there's a lag time of no less than seven days, but 10 days, 14 days before you're going to see the cases really pick up. Um, we haven't seen that yet. Um, we do know that there was a lot more activity this past weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend, than, than there have been at any time uh, since um, this public health emergency started. Obviously, that causes us some concern as to what we might see uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm praying that people were of we, for the most part, because I, I've seen pictures, I know not everybody, uh, was responsible and took care uh, to make sure that they were abiding by the social distancing, the, the mask, the, the um, hygiene practices, and so forth. But, but really, we, we won't know. Uh, all I can tell you is up to now, we haven't seen anything um, that, that indicates that we are we, uh, a, a surge in cases. That, that could come with tomorrow's data. And if it does, we'll let you know, but, but uh, otherwise, you know, we, we, don't, we don't see it. Uh, but it is critically important that, that people understand there's an awful lot of COVID-19 out there. It's, um, it's as contagious today as it was two months ago. It's as deadly today as it was uh, two months ago. And so we're asking people to, to do what, what we've been talking about all along. And, and that's, that's how we keep cases now, in addition to the uh, expanded testing and the contact tracing around those test results. That's that's going to be really critical for us going forward. Yes, ma'am. So, Coach O was on Fox News this morning, and um, obviously this is down the line, but he said that Florida is going to have more cases First of all, I'm a huge Tiger fan. It would be devastating to me. Um, and I'm optimistic. I, I choose when, when I think about this fall um, to, to think of it aspirationally. Um, and, and sometimes I let my hopes get in, in the way of what objective reasoning would indicate is the most plausible um, outcome. But, you know, I want to think that, that we're going to have uh, 
things under control and, and potentially through the testing, the contact tracing, the, uh, the development of more therapeutic treatments and all sorts of things that will have the ability uh, to resume many of those activities. I doubt that they will look exactly like they looked last year, um, except for the scoreboard. I want the scoreboard to be, look exactly the same uh, in every game. Um, but in terms of, of the number of, it, of fans who go to the games and, and so forth, um, right now I just it's hard for me to see that. But but you know I, I hope that that can happen. But uh, but you know I I, I share Coach Orgeron's um, uh, feelings on that. It, it, it would it would not be good uh, if we if we couldn't do that. And and by the way, um, I, I really think it's critically important that we get our our young people back on these college campuses too. But, and we know the key to doing that is you gotta be safe. You gotta be responsible, uh, you gotta be deliberate. And I can tell you our higher education leaders are working nonstop to develop best practices. They're doing that, talking to the Department of Health, they're doing that, talking to counterparts across the country. Um, so that's gonna be critically important too. And by the way, it's, I, under, I understand the two go hand in hand because uh, the NCAA is led by Mark Emmert, who used to be at LSU, and he's announced that if students aren't on campus, those universities are not going to be playing football. Uh, and, and I don't think he said football, I think he said sports. So we, we, it, it all goes hand in hand, and of course the educational side of the institution, um, as much as I love football and, and, and baseball and everything else, the education side of the institution is obviously the reason LSU exists, and not just LSU, this is true for all of the higher education institutions in the state of Louisiana. So we, we need to get our, our young people on campus this fall, and that will include my baby who just graduated from high school, and he'll be at LSU uh, in the fall. Leo? I had some calls from a few friends of mine at police party who some smaller municipalities around the state. They're concerned their funding's gonna get cut. Uh, what's the plan to get somehow, even though they're seeing increased calls? Have you heard anything about this? Funding, uh, I haven't. Now look, uh, Funding could be cut just because revenue is down, um, and and that's a, that's a big problem. That's part of the CARES Act funding that we have, uh, the 1.8 billion dollars. And you may recall the congressional delegation sent me a letter um, encouraging me to uh, abide by the intent of the legislation, which is that 45 percent of the share come into the state. 45 percent of the 1.8 billion, uh, almost 900 million dollars would be reserved for local government. And, and so that would be available uh, for these, these fire districts and the MES as, as well. The, the issue is you can only use this to cover expenditures related directly or indirectly to COVID-19 and not to replace lost revenue. But there's a lot of expenditures and, and, and for first responders, which would certainly fit here, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Secretary Mnuchin put out guidance that, that provides for a tremendous amount of flexibility. So we do hope that that's something that, that uh, can uh, be brought to bear uh, for local government, including the EMS and the fire stations, uh, I'm sorry, fire departments that you just uh, mentioned. And, and so we're working on that uh, presently, trying to work through uh, some issues with the legislature. But we do believe that that 45% should be reserved for, for local government. Yes, sir. Uh, Governor Jay Darden has uh, said a few times that he doesn't think locals will be able to tap into all that $811 million. The legislature obviously wants to do something different. They want to take $200 million and give it to small businesses. Given that it doesn't seem like locals are going to be able to spend it all, why not give the $200 million to small businesses? Or do you have another vision for the money? Well, for, first of all, I'll get back to what I just mentioned. When the CARES Act was passed, uh, for states that had uh, municipalities that um, uh, I think it was 500,000 in population, they received uh, an allocation of CARES Act funding directly to the municipality. Uh, and, the, and I think the way they were doing that is 45% of all of the funding that would go to that state would go to local government. So I received a letter from the, I think it was the entire congressional delegation, asking that we honor that in the state of Louisiana, even though the act itself doesn't absolutely require it. So uh, I, I agree then that we should reserve that funding for local government. It may or may not be possible for between now and the end of the year, because that's the time frame they have to do it, 
for local government to submit expenditures uh, directly or indirectly related to COVID-19 uh, with the attestations and so forth in order to draw down that full 45 percent. But we also know that our own um, Senator, Senator Kennedy, uh, is, is promoting a bill in uh, the Senate that would retroactively create even more flexibility for the funding that has already been made available so that it can replace Ross revenue. If he is successful uh, and we have uh, already uh, gone through all of the CARES Act funding, then none of it will be left for local government in order to replace revenue. Uh, so, so that's that's something else that, that I think we have to to uh, to consider. Obviously, we we want to be as helpful as we can be to business, especially small business across uh, the state of Louisiana. We do know that that uh, Congress is likely uh, to pass more legislation. I guess you'd call it Phase Four. Um, it's at some point uh, by the end of June, I think, is what we. We were told today on the National Governors Association call, it looks like that's the timeline we're going to. Uh, that that uh, bill could contain the flexibility on the $1.8 billion that, that I just mentioned, or it could contain additional dollars uh, for state and local governments, which could be used to replace the revenue. But in any case, I, I believe that we're going to be coming back, and, and I've shared this with uh, the President and the Speaker, uh, at some point in, in the, the first part of the next fiscal year uh, to get an update on the forecast. What, what is the economic uh, activity in the state like in terms of generating revenue? So what does that revenue forecast look like? Update that, but also take into consideration whatever Congress does between now and then. Uh, and then we, could, we can adjust the budget and we can also do some other things um, as well. So I'm talking about a potential special session uh, in, that, in that time period. Uh, I think that's when we ought to consider uh, what funding source we might have available. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things that the small business might prefer, let's say that same $200 million is available, uh, rather than assistance to small business to put it in the unemployment insurance trust fund, because that would, uh, that would lessen any, any likelihood or the amount of, of a tax increase in order to replenish uh, that trust fund. And so there's, there's all sorts of things that we can consider. I just don't think now is, is the right time to do that. And I want to abide by the spirit of, of the CARES Act legislation as expressed by the congressional delegation. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to social distancing, we did see a lot of people over the weekend that weren't doing that. Weren't yeah, right. say it ain't so. Yeah, what is your concern there? And uh, what do you say yeah. to those people who just won't do it, especially when they look at the numbers and think that the drug is over? Yeah, well, we know that that's not true. I mean, so, for example, we can tell you just based on individuals who tested positive, we have at least 10,000 cases of COVID-19 in the state of Louisiana today. We know that we've got a lot more than that because, uh, again, approximately 25% of the people who are going to get this disease are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. They don't know they have it. They're not going to get tested, but they are nevertheless contagious. That's one of the things that makes it very, very difficult. And so the, the mask is a huge part of making sure that we, that we don't uh, have a, a spike in cases again uh, like, like we saw a couple of months ago. Uh, and so I'm, I really am asking people to, to heed uh, the CDC guidance on this, the Department of Health guidance on this, um, and, and of course we're doing more than ask if, if you are a a business owner or an employee of a, of a business and you're coming into contact with customers, we're requiring that mask. We're strongly encouraging it for everybody else. When you leave your house and you're going to be within six feet of someone who is not in your immediate household, you need to have the mask on. Uh, and and it's, it's just the right thing to do. Uh, and I will tell you that um, I think Dr. Pauci said it best earlier today, those who don't are asking for trouble. And th those who don't are asking for trouble. And, and it's not something that many people are consciously asking for, but, but we're, we're just, for whatever reason, uh, some folks are, are, are not uh, complying with that. And we, we, need, we need compliance. Because we all have a goal to get back to as much normalcy as possible, to open up as many businesses and have them operating uh, at full capacity and so forth. And, and we're, we hope to do this over time. But, but as we do that, we have to do it safely. And because if you have cases spiking, then, then we know 
that people aren't going to be going out to eat. They're not going to be going to the store. They're not going to be resuming their lives as normal and so forth. So I, I just encourage people to do it. And look, we've had a tremendous amount of cooperation. There is only one way to go from number two in the country in per capita cases to number nine. Uh, and to go from having the highest growth rate anywhere in the country and perhaps in the world of cases uh, to where we are today. And that's because the people uh, have, for the most part, uh, done the things that we've been asking. But over time, it's human nature to kind of start to think, um, well, we're past this. Well, we're, we're not past it. And, and, and I, I hate when people say, well, will it come back in the fall? Well, it hadn't left. You know, this is the mother-in-law who stays. I shouldn't have said that. I love my mother-in-law. Um, but but, but the, so the, the point is, it has never left. And so we shouldn't talk about whether, whether it, it, um, it's going to come back. I mean, it, it's still here. And, and as long as it's going to be here and we don't have a vaccine, there is a new normal. And that new normal includes things like a mask. Yes, sir? Obviously close to that 200,000 uh, tests administered in May, as you mentioned, uh, the figure close to 180,000. Um, just a few days away. Is there any reason to think or maybe believe since the state has done a good job to this point and is most likely going to reach that mark to maybe in future months keep the goal at 200,000 or is there a chance or a reason to maybe bump that up? Yeah. Um, on, on the federal resources. I think, I think it will depend. First of all, the 200,000 number is a number that we gave uh, to the federal government. Uh, we gave that number to Admiral Gerard at uh, Health and Human Services, at the Public Health Service, um, and, and to uh, all of the officials there as our testing plan. And it's not just a number. It is where you conduct those tests, um, how much of it is mobile, uh, how much of it is, is, is responding to hot spots, how much is going into congregate settings, and, and so forth. And so we can, we can certainly increase it if, if they would resource it um, and we feel a, a need to do that. Uh, you know, as far as, as what we intend to do, I, I believe our goal, at least for May and June, is the 200,000. But I'm a, you know, he's had a long weekend to rest and y'all haven't asked any questions of Dr. B.U. He did appear in front of the Senate and Government Affairs Committee today and we hope he will be confirmed by the Senate. I'm, I'm sure he will because he's been doing an excellent job. But I'm going to ask him to come up and kind of walk through that, uh, what we think that the, the future of testing is going to be. I can tell you the federal government's talking about a testing effort all the way through the month of December. Um, and not to say that there won't be testing beyond that, but they are talking about uh, resourcing state testing, testing plans through the month of, of December. Come on up, Alice. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a difficult question to answer definitively. We, we knew that uh, first we needed to surge testing to make sure that we knew where COVID was in the state. Um, we had done a good job, again, we had met in April, the 2% goal that the federal government has set out for states to reach of the per capita population tested. But when we looked across the state, it was not evenly distributed. We still have parishes, three parishes that are below 2%, and we're working uh, really hard to get testing into those three parishes and bring them so that we can say that every parish has had at least 2% tested. But then we knew above that, uh, since we were already at 2% and hadn't reached everybody, we were going to have to double our efforts, literally, to reach those populations where we weren't seeing enough testing. Um, we know that uh, the African American population bears a, a disproportionate burden of cases and deaths related to COVID-19. So we wanted to make sure that just as we watch percent positivity across the state, we watch percent positivity within that population. And if we're seeing a high percent positivity, we don't have enough tests in those communities reaching people early enough to be able to actually control what's going on with COVID. At the same time, we've also learned a lot about the risks in congregate settings. We've learned uh, that there's asymptomatic spread that, uh, is, unlike in the general public, asymptomatic spread seems to have a real uh, large effect within congregate settings because of that close proximity. All the things that we're trying to get the public to do to keep themselves safe, um, keeping distant, you know, not um, spending a lot of time around people who aren't in your household are really tough to do in those settings. So we had to surge testing into those areas. Um, and in the near term, that's meant working really well with uh, the National Guard, who's done an outstanding job of bringing resources to communities around the state. And, and I'm just grateful for the women and men of the National Guard for that work. Um, but we don't want a system in Louisiana that relies on the National Guard being activated through December 2020 to help this. So while we've been surging into those populations, we've been doing congregate testing, the other thing we've been doing is doubling down on our longstanding partnerships with uh, community clinics, with hospitals, with federally qualified health centers, 
that serve those communities, but early in the epidemic were not resourced with the amount of specimen collection kits that they needed. And so we are trying to give them those kits so that they can uh, do the specimen collection, setting up hub and spoke models where as they collect specimens, we're not asking them to process them in-house or buy expensive equipment. Uh, instead, creating partnerships um, and, and, and contracts uh, with labs in centralized locations that we can bring those to um, so that we can get that processed quickly. All of that infrastructure, to the governor's point, is what we want to have through December 2020. All of that is what's going to put us in a good position. So your, your initial question is, are we going to need to, need to do 200,000 tests going forward? It's not clear because if COVID numbers continue to go down, if there's less COVID in the state, if people do uh, you know, act as good neighbors, wash their hands, stay home, if they're sick, wear masks, if our businesses do what we're asking them to do, protect their employees by wearing masks, protect their employees by asking the public to wear masks uh, when they come in, if all of that happens, we should see cases continue to go down. And then arbitrarily testing 200,000 people doesn't make sense. But what we want to have, if we need it, is the capacity to do 200,000 or more. Uh, and we continue to build that capacity. And, and, and what we've achieved and will achieve in this month uh, will show us that we have that capacity. And it's not something that's fly by night. It's capacity that we're building to maintain uh, through, the, through the coming months. Because we need to be prepared for whatever comes. I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. On the congregate settings, um, do you have an update on how many crawfish farms have now had clusters of coronavirus? You said last week there was three of them with 100 cases. Do you have updated numbers for how many workers at these facilities have tested positive? Uh, so I do not. And will you ever have an update on that? You, you obviously, you give these numbers for nursing homes and other facilities. I'm, I guess I'm just wondering why we haven't gotten an update on so, you know, I think we, we talked about this last Friday. I think, uh, you know, a situation in which we are giving every cluster in the state reports, uh, I think would be challenging, frankly, for the Office of Public Health to, to manage. Um, and, and really where we're drawing lines uh, then becomes a little bit arbitrary. In the context of nursing homes, there's a federal regulation that requires um, that the nursing homes report. Um, we are reporting the, the data that the, that the federal government, or some of the data that the federal government is asking. We're actually doing that down at the facility level, which we understand may not be the level that the federal government even uh, reports. We talk about other uh, high-risk congregate settings um, uh, in, in, um, uh, on our dashboard as, as adult uh, residential facilities, give those numbers an aggregate. But for businesses, uh, we do not uh, foresee a future where we're you know, uh, providing those uh, data on an ongoing basis on the website or, or otherwise. And, and again, to emphasize the, the reason for that, because I want to be clear, I had the opportunity to say this in the, in the uh, Senate Governmental Affairs Committee, and I'll repeat it here for the general public. The Office of Public Health takes transparency very seriously, and it's something that we've been um, really striving to, to achieve since the beginning of this uh, outbreak uh, under the guidance as well of the, of the governor, who, who made it clear from day one, uh, look, we may not know everything, but we need to be clear about what we don't know. Let's, let's be transparent about that, and, and as we do know things, share that as well. So that's our, that's our, our watchword. However, that has to be balanced with public health. Our main mandate is to protect and promote the health of all Louisianans and the communities across the state. And one of the ways to do that is to ensure that anybody that has uh, a COVID, uh, a, a symptoms of COVID, or any uh, organization or cluster that may have symptoms of COVID feel comfortable and in fact feel encouraged to come forward to the Louisiana Department of Health, to the Office of Public Health, and alert us to that fact, because we cannot serve those communities, those individuals, those settings without them feeling that they can freely come to us. And so that's why uh, Louisiana and many states give that protection um, and do not uh, disclose the, pr uh, the privileged health information related to those outbreaks if they do not present a risk to the public. And rest assured, if any of those do present a risk to the public, you'll know about it. What's privileged about the aggregate number? I'm not oh, asking to name The aggregate number for, for all uh, workplaces is, is essentially you know, in our overall case number. What we don't have is the ability to say, here's business-related cases, here's non-business-related cases. And I think where, where your question might lead us is starting to make arbitrary decisions about well, which businesses do we want to report on and not. And I don't think that that makes sense from a public health standpoint. There are certain communities that we do think um, uh, certainly because of, st of federal regulations and state regulations uh, and, and the particular risk uh, that those uh, groups present, like nursing homes, uh, rise to that level. Uh, but, but again, it, we wouldn't want a situation in which every business, especially now as we move into re-engaging sectors of the economy, uh, feels that they would have any incentive to hide cases from us. Uh, because first and foremost, my job uh, for the state, for all of you, 
is uh, getting control over COVID, is identifying those cases, working with the organizations uh, where the people who have COVID are, whether they're employees or, or, or residents, um, and serving uh, them and you uh, by uh, trying to get control over the outbreak and making uh, the rest of Louisiana as safe as possible. Okay, last one. Uh, another one for you. Okay. How many uh, how many nursing homes and other facilities has the state? Because I understand the state has a role in helping places that can't you know, don't have the capacity to test everyone. How many places have, has the state gone into and helped them test all their residency staff? Yeah. So I don't have that number off the top of my head. I'll say that there's there's sort of you know three different groups, uh, which is one of the reasons I, I wouldn't have that number. One is you know most most nursing homes across the state have told us. You know, we're interested in, in testing, but like those federally qualified health centers or other clinics I was talking about earlier, we just don't have the kits. And so one of the things that our regional medical directors are doing is making sure that they have the supplies needed to collect specimens. Nursing homes have medical directors, have medical teams able to do that work if they were so supplied. So a large group uh, are, are doing that testing without needing much more support from us apart from the kits, which we were fortunate enough to get from the, the federal government, as well as relationships we're building with labs uh, that have their own kits around the state. Um, another group are facilities that are asking for help um, uh, because uh, there's uh, you know, maybe more than, than their medical teams feel that they can control uh, or they're just looking for the best practices in testing and so we have that ability uh, to go in and help with testing especially if, they're, uh, if there's constraints on taf test, sorry, uh, staff time. Um, and, and I don't have that number of how many we've directly tested versus supplied. The, the third group though is, is um, work that we've been doing from the beginning virtually uh, in infection control assessment and response. And that's a comprehensive CDC developed um, uh, protocol essentially of going through and understanding uh, what are the procedures in place, who might need testing, um, what are the, you know, the PPE levels that you have on, on hand, what are the uh, protocols you have for training staff, have you reduced or rather ended congregate dining, all those kinds of uh, uh, issues that we want to make sure every nursing home knows. Um, as they, especially as they have cases or as they have suspected cases. We've been doing that virtually from the beginning. We have uh, now in this month uh, stood up what we call uh, strike teams that are doing that work uh, as well. And so we have a number of facilities that we've gone in physically uh, to do that work, um, prioritizing those um, where there's, there's a, a request from them for, for help and certainly where we're hearing uh, about concerns maybe through our epi data or through others in their community. I don't have that number either, but those three groups um, are, are, are our focus. Thank you. Thank you also. We will be back at uh, this location Friday yep, 2 at 2.30 p.m. for our next uh, press conference. Thank you again for covering this, and thanks again to the people of Louisiana. Um, we have made tremendous progress over the last couple of months, uh, and it's a result of, of their compliance uh, and their patience. Um, and, and I would just uh, urge you to continue to do that. Uh, we do remain uh, in phase one. Uh, and, uh, you know, we we're looking forward to going to phase two as we are able and when we are able. Uh, and we hope to have an announcement on that. Uh, well, I guess we will have an announcement. Just don't know what the announcement will be uh, early next week. So, so thank you, and we'll see you back here on Friday.